Virgin Steel from Long Island, New York was formed in 1981 by French-born guitarist Jack Starr. He'd be joined by drummer Joey Evasion and bassist Kelly Nichols while they looked for a vocalist. It took a long time because I had a definite idea for a singer in mind. I wanted somebody with range, with power, and who basically had a killer scream, like what we call pillar crumbling. Singer David DeFay would be recommended to Joey by a friend, so both Joey and Jack went to David's house for an informal audition. We had been doing formal interviews with people coming in with resumes and everything, but we just went to Dave's basement and he had a Hammond organ there, and he started playing Child in Time by Deep Purple. We were sitting there waiting to see whether he could do the screams at the end. Me and Joey were looking at each other, is he going to hit those notes? He fucking hit those notes, and he blew Ian Gillen away. We looked at each other and said, okay, we got our singer. David would come on board, and at his suggestion, they'd also replace Kelly Nichols with Joe O'Reilly, a friend of David's from music school. With the initial lineup formed in 1981, they'd record a demo and start sending it out to labels, including Mike Varney of Shrapnel Records, who included the track Children of the Storm on his U.S. Metal Volume 2 compilation. Despite the rough production, Children of the Storm is pretty great. It's packed with powerful, catchy riffs and nice compositional elements that elevate it above your standard metal banger. The response to the track was so positive, Virgin Steel decided to take the demo they'd made and release it as an album independently, ultimately pressing and selling 10,000 copies. Virgin Steel, or Virgin Steel 1 if you like, is a bit of a mess. It definitely sounds like a demo with hissy room tone, and David is clearly still honing his voice, leaning more towards a Robert Plant style that doesn't always work. But that said, the musicianship is there, and the songwriting shows a lot of potential, even if it's pulling from several hard rock influences at once. Going from stuff like American Girl with Shades of Riot and the very Led Zeppelin-ish Drive On Through, to the Judas Priest-styled Living in Sin. It's a life of sin, just a life of sin. Evil looks in the wind, in this life of sin. And you can never win when you're living in sin. Also included is a blues rock number, a pretty cool guitar instrumental, and even a rock ballad with Still in Love with You. Overall, it's not exceptionally compelling, but there is some very good stuff on here as well, including the full version of Children of the Storm with an additional three epic minutes at the end that got cut from the US Metal 2 version. The closing track is also great and worth checking out for being a rare trifecta. 
Virgin Steel by Virgin Steel from the album Virgin Steel. They'd follow this up with Guardians of the Flame in 1983. With the band now signed to a handful of independent labels, including Music for Nations, this album is a definite improvement in production quality. The songs were being written by Jack and Dave, separately for the most part, and it does feel like there are two musical approaches trying to work together. On the one hand, you have fairly straightforward, hard rock tracks like Burn the Sun and Metal City. But then you also have the more compositional, intricate tracks like the two they collaborated on. The first of the two, The Redeemer, nails the Dio era rainbow vibe with a heavy late 70s feel and showcases a little more of Dave's keyboard skills. My favorite song off here though is the title track, Guardians of the Flame. It starts off more or less like other songs on the album and then goes into a great emotional chorus. I feel like another influence on this had to be the 1980 album Back on My Hill by German prog metal band Faithful Breath. Guardians of the Flame shares a very similar melody to the track Judgment Day, and both songs also have epic synth solos. And of course, Jack Starr lays down some excellent solos that are just as great on these more elaborate tracks as the traditional ones. But all these different influences are utilized really well, whether they sound familiar or not. The best example of this may be the closing track, A Cry in the Night. Even though it's 
clearly based on Canon in D, otherwise known as the wedding song that isn't Here Comes the Bride. A Cry in the Night takes the basis of the classical piece and adds power, lyrics, and electric guitar to create something that's entirely virgin steel. And just to cause a little extra identity crisis confusion, you'd have a couple different options for album covers. There's the US version, which is perhaps the most accurate, and the cover that most of Europe got, which is a little more interesting and bizarre. Or you could go super minimal with the baby blue French version. Virgin Steel would also release a pair of EPs in 1983. The one released in America was Wait for the Night, which contained Don't Say Goodbye and three new tracks, including Wait for the Night. It's a great, catchy track that was left off the version released overseas, which included a cry in the night instead of don't say goodbye, and an interview with the band instead of wait for the night. These EPs would end up being the last Virgin Steel releases with Jack Starr, who hadn't been seeing eye to eye with Dave creatively. We had a mutual parting of the ways, and it was for the best, because I wanted to pursue a more guitar-driven music and Dave preferred a more keyboard progressive sound. Jack took the band name with him when he left, intending to continue as Virgin Steel, but the rights to the name would end up going to David. Jack would be replaced by guitarist Edward Persino, a much better fit with Dave's songwriting sensibilities, to record Virgin Steel's third album, Noble Savage. There's a different energy right away, kicking off with the excellent opener, We Rule the Night. It's heavy and powerful, and also has a sort of holding out for a hero power pop quality. But this is far more heavy metal focused, with Ed's fantastic guitar soloing worked in perfectly. Released through Cobra Records, Noble Savage is still a bit all over the place musically, but the stuff that works on here really works. It is undoubtedly a positive message, the one we wanted to give with Noble Savage. Our Noble Savage depicted on the cover fights the adversities of life, the injustices and abuses that contaminate today's world. With only his strength and his invincible sword, he defeats evil and makes good triumph. There's also some Man of War mixed in here too, which is most noticeable in Fight Tooth and Nail. But rather 
Rather than taking a strict true metal stance, Virgin Steel is also willing to mix in softer, poppier, and more emotional melodies along with the barbaric riffs. Oh, take me I don't know what you'd call what we're doing, but if you have to give it a label, I'd say adventure music, drama music, music that has movement and light and shade to it while conveying an image of adventure. This idea is perhaps best captured in the closing track, Angel of Light, a sprawling epic with a hard rock build to a passionate chorus. Angel of Light descends on the earth to challenge the might of the sun. It then goes into a piano section, which is followed by a sudden shift to a prog metal solo with a funk bass line. They'd get better at this sort of thing, but I love the unusual ideas. Plus, Angel of Light is possibly the best track on the album, and a great early example of adventurous virgin steel power metal. No more tears are dying on his throne, he's shining, raise the challenge I think we have a nice variety on the record, with tracks that have that commercial edge, but also the usual Virgin Steel epics too. We feel it's a well-rounded album, and the next one will continue in that vein, with a good balance of material. Virgin Steel's fourth album, Age of Consent, would pretty much do exactly that. Aside from the somewhat heavy-handed, barely legal theme, Age of Consent maintains a similar feel to Noble Savage, with a few tracks that are just okay, and some that are outright epic. The new material is very heavy, very up, very positive, and I think it's going to be an even stronger record than Noble Savage. We're very confident and proud of the new songs. Good songs, good playing, singing, drumming, bass playing, and some ponderous keyboards too. The Burning of Rome is easily the most standout track on here, and is another great blend of power, melody, and atmosphere. And Dave has really found his voice by this point, bringing even more passion and power to excellent tracks like Lion and Winter. While there are songs on here I could do without, the high points are extremely high. All 
Also, if you bought the CD version, you'd get the extra track, Let It Roar, which for me could have easily replaced something like 17 or Stay On Top. However, even with future Virgin Steel classics on it, Age of Consent would pretty much flop at the time of release due to a lack of marketing and promotion by small indie label Maze Music. And although Joe O'Reilly is credited with playing bass, he'd apparently been sick during recording, so Ed and Dave would fill in for this album. But he'd grow increasingly disillusioned with the music industry, and by 1992, he'd leave it all together. He'd be replaced at first by Teddy Cook, and then by Rob DiMartino, and they both appear on Virgin Steel's fifth album, Life Among the Ruins. This one would take a somewhat surprising turn into a mostly bluesier sound with more of a focus on steamy rock and David Coverdale style crooning. It is an odd entry, even though they'd had bluesy elements before, but a lot of the energetic power is gone, as well as the more intriguing compositional elements they'd touched on previously. However, Edward Persino still delivers plenty of slick metal solos throughout the album, which are always a highlight. Most importantly though, we finally get some Virgin Steel music videos. I Dress in Black, first video we've ever really done. The song's about someone searching for truth in a decaying world and uh, inviting someone along with him. Love is Pain would also get a video, this time with snippets of David breaking up with someone. Because, you know, love is pain. Snakeskin Voodoo Man, a track exclusive to the US version, got a video with the distinction of featuring Joey Buttafuoco of all people. But Afuko was basically this goof from New York that got into a sexual relationship with a minor and made national news in 1992 when she then went and tried to kill his wife. Here's the deal. We're good friends with Joey's brother Bobby. 
He owned a club with a room upstairs where we rehearsed. Joey was doing everything to attract media attention and wanted to be part of the video shoot for Tale of the Snakeskin Voodoo Man. Finally, Never Believed in Goodbye would also get a video where the band all agrees to take a limo to a mansion and play in the staircase. The rose that you gave me just died today I guess you won't be coming back And the fire in your eyes has grown colder now I guess you won't be coming back I actually like this track quite a bit, in large part because it reminds me so much of Whitesnake. Nineteen ninety three was definitely a weird time for metal and a lot of heavy bands were changing up their sound. But after Life Among the Ruins, many diehard fans were concerned Virgin Steel was going soft. Okay, uh, I just gotta say this. There's been some talk about... I know a lot of, a lot of, uh, a lot of people are fans of the Noble Savage album and such, and we love that album as well, and they think that uh, we've gotten a little soft on some of the things on the Life Among the Ruins I've heard. But that's okay, you know, a lot of people still enjoy the record. Well, I don't think we've gotten soft at all. Thankfully, David would be inspired by another idea the following year. Something bigger and bolder and far more awesome. The Marriage of Heaven and Hell Part 1. Rather than continue to retread bluesy 70s rock stuff, Dave takes the more interesting ideas he'd touched on in previous albums and masterfully blends them together. The opening track is a great example, starting off with aggressive riffing and a fist-pumping melodic chorus. But then it transitions through a short interlude into an uplifting, lighter passage. And the track culminates with a phenomenal combination of the two themes, resulting in an epic mix of power, melody, and emotion. The entire album explores heavy-ass riffs and fierce vocals juxtaposed against beautifully composed melodies and just the right amount of that power-pop feel. One of my favorite examples is Blood and Gasoline, which has a very cinematic feel to me. It has the high octane energy you want in a metal song, but the catchy as hell melodies and use of piano give it a sultry, seductive element as well. But that cinematic feel could apply to the majority of the album, with different tracks evoking different emotions, and the ballads are also greatly improved. Forever Will I Roam is pretty good, and House of Dust is freaking excellent.
basically every track on here deserves a mention, but I do have to call out the terrific track Life Among the Ruins, which I have to assume was written so no one could ever say Life Among the Ruins is too soft ever again. Rob DiMartino would miss out on recording on this album since he was busy touring with Richie Blackmore's Rainbow, which left Ed and Dave handling the bass work once again. Rob would be back for the tour, but further commitments would keep him from appearing on the following album as well, The Marriage of Heaven and Hell Part 2. Part 2 is an excellent follow-up to Part 1 and follows along the same formula, right down to the god-awful album cover. I feel like this one does have a little more of that Man of War sound though, especially on the opening track. and Edward's emotive guitar work continues to blend seamlessly with Dave's songwriting and keyboards. And as with part one, those heavy, powerful riffs are complemented by more theatrical or cinematic musical passages that add even more depth. The two sides work together tremendously to deliver outstanding, exciting power metal that's both catchy and forceful at the same time. the marriage of heaven and hell is solidly in the power metal genre, part of what makes these albums great is their mixture of 70s, 80s, and 90s sounds that still stick to a singular vision, which contains an incredible amount of variety, yet still feels cohesive and connected. I wanted to push the envelope both in the musical song construction level as well as the lyrical side. I wanted to max myself out and the talents of the group to increase our depth, range, and scope on all fronts to come up with works that were unique, passionate, driven, heartfelt, and progressive in the full meaning of that term. Forward thinking and reaching to carve out our own space in the rock metal firmament and leave our own distinct mark. While Rob would be back on board after recording, Joey had decided to retire from the music business before they were finished and was replaced by Frank Gilchrist. This new lineup would record Virgin Steel's eighth album, Invictus. Invictus is the final chapter in this trilogy, a primal scream of pure rage full of power and majesty that one can arm oneself with to combat the ills of the world. Invictus is technically the Marriage of Heaven and Hell Part 3, but it's a bit more ambitious, with a more focused narrative and a greater use of orchestration. While David's keys had been a prominent component of Virgin Steel since the Marriage of Heaven and Hell Part 1, you really start to feel their versatility here.
There's a lot more of that man of war feel here too. I feel like Dave's lore register on the marriage of heaven and hell part one often had a John Bush quality to it. And by Invictus, his lower voice comes off a little more like Eric Adams. But again, that's just one layer of virgin steel. And this album is also full of uplifting, epic elements mixed in with the aggressive riffs, often shifting emotions completely within the same track. But along with the soaring orchestration and aggressive, blood-hungry riffs, when Invictus kicks in, it goes for what I would consider a more modern power metal sound. No matter what mood or emotion the song calls for, those Edward Persino solos nail it every time. Invictus is excellent, and it's almost not even worth calling out specific tracks because it works so well as a whole. But I have to mention Defiance, mainly for having a running wild vibe, which is always a plus to me. Following their most ambitious album to date, Dave would manage to take Virgin Steel's next project even further, with a massive story covering two albums and three discs, the first of which was released in 1999, The House of Atreus Act 1. Featuring only Dave, Ed, and Frank, the House of Atreus is based on a trilogy of Greek tragedies called the Orestia. It has a lot to do with the, what happened after the Trojan War when Agamemnon came home and was murdered in the bath by his wife. But even though it's set in ancient times, David also saw the story as an allegory for modern life. This, this particular House of Atreus cycle of myths, I read a long time ago, and it stayed with me, I think because, number one, the myths are really timeless and the characters even if they're gods goddesses demons or whatever they are they all they all behave very humanly very real so those myths i can use them as a platform a jumping off point for what i want to say what kind of commentary i want to make about modern life my life the shape of the world today Once again, this is a terrific album that delivers on pretty much every level. And while it definitely works best when listened to in its entirety, House of Atreus Act 1 is full of great songs that stand out on their own. And 
and while it still maintains the epic power metal riffs and melodic songwriting, the House of Atreus brings even more of a big theatrical feel than Invictus, with 22 tracks and no less than 7 instrumentals. But the instrumentals are worked in really well, with a variety of sounds and moods that keep them each feeling fresh and different. Apparently, this metal opera was written with a theatrical production in mind, and there were some productions put up of the House of Atreus, including at the Mimingen City Theater in Germany. Now you live and now you die. Across the lake of Morgan's eyes. Curse of blood and heroes crack. I wish I could find the entire performance because it looks absolutely bananas, especially with the actors all performing the lyrics in character. I love how low budget this production is and that no one seems to be a particularly good singer. It's so great. And also, a juggalo shows up for some reason. Following an EP featuring mainly a mix of previously released and upcoming tracks, Virgin Steel would put out the double album The House of Atreus Act 2 in October of 2000. Act 2 is very much a continuation of Act 1 in sound and feel, and for the most part maintains the momentum of the first. Overall, Disc 1 is really solid, although perhaps less consistent than Act 1, and I mostly find myself drawn to the full songs more than the theatrical elements here. And again, I can't say enough good stuff about Ed Persino's guitar work, which elevates every track to some degree. Disc 2 also has some good stuff on it, but it also has a lot of what kind of feel like a series of unused interludes that Dave was just determined to get on the album. Don't get me wrong, House of Atreus Act 2 is extremely solid overall, but I'd also say it could probably have been cut down to one even better album.
This would be followed by The Book of Burning in 2002, which contains re-recorded songs from the first two Virgin Steel albums, along with re-recorded tracks that David DeFay and Jack Starr had written as a project called Reunion of Steel in 1997 that unfortunately didn't make it past the demo phase. The previously unreleased tracks are all pretty solid, especially with Edward Persina on guitar, along with newcomer Josh Block on guitar and bass, and Frank Zummo splitting drumming duties with Frank Gilchrist. The re-recorded tracks sound great too, and yes, it's nice to be able to finally understand the lyrics to Children of the Storm, but with all the tweaks and changes, I personally still prefer the originals, even with the lower production quality. But to be honest, after getting through House of Atreus, which altogether is two and a half hours long, it was refreshing to go back to something more stripped down and straightforward. And after years of consistently solid output, Virgin Steel would slow down a bit here with their next album coming out in 2006, Visions of Eden. Subtitled The Lilith Project, a barbaric romantic movie of the mind, Visions of Eden tells the story of Lilith, depicted in some mythologies as Adam's first wife. It's scaled way back compared to House of Atreus, but still very theatrical with the elaborate compositional songwriting you expect from Virgin Steel. Contrary to what the title might suggest, Visions of Eden is not about happiness, peace, contentment, or eternal tranquility. It's about disorder, strife, struggle, dominance, the annihilation of a culture, and the violation of a human being. It's a work based on the destruction of paganism, Gnosticism, and the eradication of the goddess principle. The album is really about today, modern times, and how we might have arrived here to this strange place we are now in. It's still a pretty good album and easy to listen to overall, although it still drags in spots, and I wouldn't say it reaches the heights of previous Virgin Steel albums. And like House of Atreus, Visions of Eden also had productions put up at the City Theater in Memmingen, Germany. There was apparently also an opera produced called The Rebels, made up of music from the Marriage Albums and Invictus, but unfortunately, I couldn't find any footage. And I know the band did shoot some videos for tracks off this album later on, but since they're mostly just home video footage mixed with too many Photoshop effects, I'll leave them alone. Except for this one, which was released back in 2012 for a track that appeared on the reissue of Age of Consent in 1997. The video starts with David creating various fire hazards, followed by shots of the band playing in different places like the beach, the backyard, and in David's living room. The gods are mighty, children of the fray. Part of what I love about this is the homemade look and feel. It's like in high school when the metalheads in AV Club would make guerrilla style music videos of their favorite metal songs. Tell her that you saw. 
Except this is actually Virgin Steel, with David doing all his own stunts. They put this video out right after touring for their 2010 album, Black Light Bacchanalia, which somehow or other has something to do with the God of Wine. Wow. Yeah. Ah. This one is a little weird. It's still pretty heavy and there are some cool bits here and there, but overall, nothing really stuck out that much to me musically. And for some reason, David's singing here often sounds like there's someone sleeping in the next room and he's trying not to wake them up. The Black Light Bacchanalia is kind of meandering, and there aren't really any strong hooks or riffs to get into from my perspective. While previous Virgin Steel albums had done an excellent job of evoking specific, powerful emotions, this one just felt pretty bland overall, with overly long tracks that don't really go anywhere. They'd follow this up five years later with 2015's Nocturnes of Hellfire and Damnation. Yeah. All right. Featuring Dave, Ed, Josh, and a drum machine, this album was really hard to find, and frankly, even harder to sit through. You gotta grow. I can't pretend that it's 1985. I have to be in the skin that I am in now. And that record is a very, very good uh, testament to where the band is and where I am personally at. So I just said, at this point in time, I'm just gonna do what I really want to do. I want to, if nobody likes it, I don't care. This is who I am right now. This is what I'm feeling. I'm not really sure how to take that because this is a really difficult album to follow. It's plotting, clunky, and I hate to say it, but boring. And not even Ed's guitar work does much to help. And Dave's new obsession with throwing out little roars all the time is also pretty strange. This finally brings us to Virgin Steel's most recent release, Seven Devils Moonshine in 2018. This actually contains five albums, two of which are previously released compilations, and three are brand new albums full of unbridled weirdness. If you absolutely have to listen to one of these, I suppose Ghost Harvest Vintage 1, Black Wine for Morning, is marginally better than the other two, but it's still full of dull melodies and absolutely insane vocal choices. Ghost Harvest Vintage 2, Red Wine for Warning, is almost beyond words. It's incredibly bizarre, 
to the point that you have to wonder who this is supposed to appeal to. With the wackadoo choices Dave is making, you could possibly call it experimental. But unless the experiment was to sound like 90s Adam Sandler singing a ZZ Top cover, I'm not sure what the point was. When it drives big Zamboni and it rises several plane, you sail across the water looking for lowest line down in the dungeon. Strange. The third of the new albums was Gothic Voodoo Anthems, and it's more of the same with depressing rearrangements of classic Virgin Steel tracks, off-the-wall and partially troubling cover tunes, and a few indecipherable originals. Murder and torture, they rape and they slow, claim in the way of the cross. I can't pretend to know what the thinking is behind these tracks, but for whatever reason, Dave seems intent on pursuing this unusual sound for now. But putting aside the last few albums, Virgin Steel is still a legendary metal band with several extremely solid, heavy albums with a blend of aggressive riffs and seductive melodies that delivered a whole new style of US power metal. And if you're not familiar with Virgin Steel, now's the perfect time to get caught up. Your homework should include Guardians of the Flame, although I wouldn't necessarily start there. But that, and Noble Savage, Age of Consent, The Marriage of Heaven and Hell Parts 1 and 2, Invictus, and The House of Atreus Acts 1 and 2, are all fantastic albums that are well worth checking out. I'd say Visions of Eden is also overall pretty good, and to be honest, Life Among the Ruins gets a bad rap. It's more hard rock than heavy metal, but it's light years better than much of the recent stuff. They haven't really announced anything new recently, but one thing we've learned is that David DeFay could be working on literally anything right now. So who knows what's on the horizon? Anyway, that's Virgin Steel. As always, thanks for watching, and see you next time. Good night, we'll see ya!